Okay, good morning everyone. So I'm going to be presented about thyroid and pregnancy. Um, what are the latest updates on how to deal with hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism during pregnancy? So uh, lot, what are the lot of guidelines, lot of numbers? So we'll make it as simple as possible for uh, non-endocrinologists to understand how to treat thyroid in pregnancy. It's very simple. The first is let's see pregnancy. It's a natural state of stress for the thyroid gland. If patients have a normal thyroid gland, their thyroid output will increase by 25 to 50 percent during pregnancy because the women with hypothyroidism are not able to do it. We have to replace additional thyroxine from outside. So anyone who becomes pregnant, we have to increase the thyroid dose. The thyroid and the, the, the most common uh, thyroid picture you see in pregnancy is a high total T4 and high total T3. So uh, this is because of a high estrogen in pregnancy which increases your thyroid binding globulin concentration and therefore that causes the total T4 to go up and the free T4, T3 concentrations will go down. So a high total T4, high total T3 is very normal in pregnancy, it's physiological, you don't have to do anything about it. The other thing is the HCG which increases many fold in pregnancy has a similar homologous structure to TSH and therefore HCG actually stimulates the T3, T4 receptors in just like the TSH and therefore you have a, a HCG which goes up and TSH which goes down. And there is also an increased peripheral metabolism of thyroxine needing to uh, uh, low T3 and T4 levels. And important thing to understand is that the fetal thyroid does not function until 10 to 12 weeks time and therefore we have to replace what we have to give that additional supplementation that the fetus require in the first uh, first trimester, especially in the first trimester. So this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, the relation between the TSH and the HCG. As the HCG levels as it, as the HCG levels uh, go up in the first trimester, the TSH drops, and then once the HCG levels Continue, uh, start, start dropping, TSH takes over. So they have like a, synon it's a synergistic effect uh, or you can say complementary effect one against the other. Now what what uh, is the thing that we are treating? What are What is the numbers that we are seeing? Is there a lot of hypothyroidism? There's an epi epidemiological study done in 11 cities and we found that using a TSH cutoff of 2.5 or less, we have almost 44, 44%, 32% and 34% uh, uh, prevalence of uh, hypothyroidism in pregnancy. So whether to screen or not, this is a simple thing. I'm going to skip this slide. A lot of meta-analysis have said that and we, yes, we understand that thyroid is very common. We all know, you know, and we have to screen th all patients. So uh, the international, uh, the Indian Thyroid Society and the uh, FOXI, which is the um, uh, the main society which involves the uh, the pregnant, the obst obstetric and gynecological societies of India, they uh, su suggest that all pregnant females should be screened for TSH uh, in the first antenatal visit itself. So this is a common practice. It's good. It, Ten years ago, it probably did not happen, but now all women who come to the conception at the f uh, come to the antenatal or a prenatal visit, they all the all the all of them are having the TSH values checked. So that is simple. Screening, everybody gets a screening. What are the reference values? There are many guidelines, ATA, ETA, Indian Thoracic Guidelines, almost similar to uh, each other and we have like a, 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 a cutoff of 2.5 for the first trimester and 3 or 3.5 sometimes for the second and third trimesters. So generally 2.5 and 3 are taken as the uh, hard end points. And the ITS and FOXI guidelines also have the similar cut off. So first trimester 2.5, second trimester 3 and third trimester 3. Then what, what is the need to treat hypothyroidism in pregnancy? The first risk of uh, hypothyroidism is miscarriage which is not mentioned here for some reason but that is the first miscarriage, uh, first, first uh, real uh, risk that happens with subclinical hypothyroidism also. There are many studies to, to, to support this. Uh, even a TSH of borderline high TSH will cause a higher risk of miscarriages. Other risks are all there. We don't see that them very commonly. The most, the common things that we see is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, preeclampsia, and uh, uh, that is the main thing we come across clinically. The fetal risks of cognitive development, neurological uh, abnormalities, these are all there theoretically. There's no papers. I've gone through this extensively previously because we have to give the risk stratification to mothers who are 
un who are newly diagnosed with hypothyroidism and have not come across any papers which said that there is actually a cognitive impairment. The what they have studied is that in in the past where their mothers are, were not treated with hypothyroidism, they followed up the babies and they had a slightly low IQ, but they caught the babies caught on. They have. Uh, they have developed a normal IQ a little later, but otherwise there is no real neurological abnormalities or developmental abnormalities with untreated hypothyroidism. Of course, we have to treat it because we don't know what the outcome is, but generally, the earlier you treat in the pregnancy, the better. Then, um, uh, these are all the risks. If you see overt hypothyroidism carries a much higher risk, especially of this pre uh, you know pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, the uh, IUGR and intrauterine deaths are much higher in overt hypothyroidism than subclinical hypothyroidism. Even if you take the delivery and neonatal outcomes, the, the risks are higher for like overall caesarean section rate, fetal distress, and preterm de delivery and neonatal complications. Coming to subclinical hypothyroidism, it, this is also very important to treat in uh, pregnancy because uh, it also carries a risk of, uh, uh, of a miscarriage and other risks that I was mentioning about. Uh, not to as extent as overt hypothyroidism, but definitely uh, the risk is there. So uh, the main risk is they are three times more likely to be complicated by a placental abruption, which will lead to a miscarriage. And uh, uh, preterm birth was also twofold higher in subclinical hypothyroidism. If you say, take a systematic uh, review and a meta-analysis, you see that the the risk is, uh, is is very high. So almost twofold, 2.1 placental abruption, 2.1 for neonatal death, 2.5. Eight, so definitely two times the risk of not treating. Um, so these are a couple of stud studies that I wanted to uh, we wanted to highlight. So first thing is uh, the first study. If you see, they they gave three. They divided the, uh, the the pool into three groups: double blind randomized control trial. These are all women with subclinical hypothyroidism with a TSH of more than 2.5. The group one were TPO antibody negative. So just a slightly higher TSH, but no antibodies. The group two had uh, uh, t uh, subclinical uh, hypothyroidism, TPO negative, but did not receive uh, levothyroxine. The first group received levothyroxine. So these are all negative patients, antibody negative. The first group received uh, thyroxine. The second group did not receive. The third group were just euthyroid controls with TPO antibody negative. Now the outcomes were uh, that in, in the groups which had the antibodies, uh, um, and uh, in, the, in, the, in sorry, in the, in the groups which were TPO antibody negative but did not receive levothyroxine, that means in patients who had a TSH of more than 2.5 antibody negative but did not receive levothyroxine, the risk of um, a preterm delivery was much higher. So the if the, the patients who were given uh, levothyroxine were even if the antibodies were negative, they had a lower rate of uh, uh, preterm delivery compared to the. Uh, control group and compared to the patients who were actually giving the, uh, not given the levothyroxine. In the second study, they saw all women with only subclinical hypothyroidism or TPO antibody positive positivity, whether they've given, uh, whether uh, giving levothyroxine made any difference or not. So the results showed that in women with subclinical hypothyroidism and or TPO antibody positive, levothyroxine supplementation significantly decreased pregnancy loss and preterm birth. So to to summarize, the, the, it's the simple, this, uh, you, if, if antibody negative, positive, doesn't matter. TP, TSH more than 2.5, treat. You give, uh, you give uh, levothyroxine. For overt hypothyroidism, definitely you should give a higher dose and you have to maintain the target uh, TSH around 2.5. And patients with pre-existing hypothyroidism, the levothyroxine dose should be increased by 30% as soon as the pregnancy is diagnosed. And regularly, we have to monitor the TSH every four to six weeks until they're near the gestation. In the first trimester, for every four weeks, in the second and third trimester, you can probably relax to six to eight weeks if the TSH is normal. And that in uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, the uh, Indian Thoracic Society and FOXI guidelines recommend that levothyroxine is recommended for women, definitely for women who have a TSH of more than 10, but also in, women, in TPO antibody positive women with TSH four to 10. Now, what happens in patients with, in uh, women with uh, TPO antibody negative but have a higher TSH or in t TPO antibody positive uh, with a TSH between 2.5 to 4? Again, to make it simple, if TSH is more than 2.5, treat. Simple as that. Here it says can be considered because the evidence is not strong. 
the uh, evidence for the first two statements is very strong the evidence for second two statement is weak that's why it says it can be considered but in real practice we just treat anyone who is more than 2.5 TSH what do we do postpartum in postpartum if patients who have had pre-existing hypothyroidism what happens is the TSH comes back to the what the antenatal levels were so the in, in if for example if a patient was requiring 100 micrograms of levothyroxine during pregnancy they will go back to 75 micrograms which they were previously using before pregnancy you will just switch to the same dose after delivery and uh, if the patients were newly diagnosed with hypothyroidism in pregnancy it depends if let's say they were using very minimal dose of thyroxine which is 25 or 50 they might not actually require thyroxine later depends on their antibody status also so you can wean off and stop and see if they actually require it you can always recheck the TSH in a couple of months after delivery and see if they require the thing and but all these women require annual monitoring because anybody who required pregnancy uh, hypothyroid uh, who required a hypothyroid medicine or levothyroxine in pregnancy they are prone to get hypothyroidism in the future now let's come to you thyroid pregnant women with thyroid immunity this is something that we don't see because we don't really check antibodies un unless your TSH is abnormal there is some meta-analysis to suggest that again the women with TPO antibodies have a higher risk of poorer pregnancy outcomes and neonatal outcomes when compared to uh, thyroid antibody negative. The, the evidence is poor, it's not a very uh, uh, highly, uh, highly, ev uh, highly uh, recommended evidence. So what they say is that in patients who are euthyroid, especially if they have a pregnancy loss in the past you check for their antibodies their antibodies positive even if they are euthyroid they will benefit from some levothyroxine because as you see in this study there are 115 pregnant TPO antibody uh, women with a TSH of less than 3 and they were randomized to thyroxine or placebo and you see the patients who received the levothyroxine had much less rate of miscarriage and preterm delivery as compared to the red bar which is a TPO antibody positive euthyroid patients who were not given levothyroxine and what happens when you um, so we'll see the effects of levothyroxine treatment on pregnancy outcomes it's the same thing I think the pre-term pre -term delivery and the neonatal, uh, re neonatal uh, admission risk is higher so in patients who are treated the risk is lower in patients who are not treated the risk is higher so in, in lines with this evidence, the uh, Indian, Thoracic so Indian uh, Thyroid Society and the FOXI 2009-2019 recommend the same thing. In patients who, have, who are euthyroid with thyroid immunity, you uh, see how, who are euthyroid in the early stages of pregnancy, they should be monitored with TSH levels at least once in the trimester for at least up to second trimester. Levothyroxine ca can be considered in euthyroid pregnant women with TPO antibody positive especially if there is a history of pregnancy loss if there is no history of pregnancy loss you can wait again the evidence you say is 2B and C it's not very strong evidence so that was about hypothyroidism now come to hyperthyroidism the most common cause of hyperthyroidism uh, is Graves uh, hyperthyroidism but we do see a lot of gestational thyrotoxicosis just because of the fact that the HCG is over, -stim over um, stimulated or you can say the levels of HCG are very high therefore it stimulates the thyroid in a in an excess way causing more thyroxine to be produced causing the gestational thyrotoxicosis this is a transient state it can be generally seen in thin women who are um, uh, who are uh, who's their thin primary gravida women who have uh, for example um, uh, uh, take their antibodies they are negative just wait and see the thyroxine uh, the thyroid levels will resolve by its own Graves disease is something that we have to check for if the antibodies are positive then we have to give them uh, antithyroid drugs what drugs we give let's come to that uh, effects of pregnancy on Graves disease the, you can do it two ways pregnancy on Graves disease Graves disease on pregnancy untreated Graves disease will cause maternal um, uh, you know uh, cardiac failure and uh, increased cardiac output so that the untreated hyperthyroidism can be bad for the mother especially the mother not for the child but there is a pregnancy loss also if that happens but if the uh, effect, effect of pregnancy on Graves disease uh, you see that in the, the, the Graves disease generally behaves in, in pregnancy this is what we have been taught Graves disease behaves in pregnancy because pregnancy is a state of reduced immunity if you have reduced immunity your autoantibodies will also come down therefore your Graves will get better and after postpartum you have an, again a flare-up of the Graves disease um, 
Now, uh, how do we treat? We treat with either uh, antithyroid drugs, either uh, carbimazole or propyl thyroxyl. Uh, the, these are all the reports that have been shown as to how many, what happens in patients who have been treated with any of the antithyroid drugs. And the evidence is just clear in the fact that carbimazole or methimazole, they have a higher risk of um, uh, upper GI disorders. For example, if you see esophageal atresia, um, um, uh the aplasia cutis, these are the uh, congenital abnormalities which were slightly higher risk in this group compared to PTO. PTO had a slightly lesser group. So in view of this minimal evidence that we have, it's still uh, recommended that we should not use carbimazole in the first trimester. This is all from a Danish study which uh, confirmed the same thing that there is a slightly higher risk of birth defects, uh, upper GI, birth def upper GI and uh, you know uh, the uh, nasopharynx and the aplysia cutis. These are the main risks that were there. They were higher in the carbimazole group compared to the PTU group. So uh, the, the, the guidelines just say that in conclusion PTU both are associated with increased prevalence of birth defects, but PTU is much more safer to be used in the first trimester. Mind you, high doses of PTU can cause fulminant hepatitis, so you have to watch for LFTs, but if you are using at a very low dose of 50, 100 or 150, you should be fine. As soon as the patient uh, finishes the first trimester, you are allowed to switch to carbimazole because by then the, uh, the neonatal you know, endo-organ formations, it's all intact so you can switch to carbimazole or methimazole in the second trimester. In the first trimester please use PTU. Simple conversion um, 5 milligrams of carbimazole is equal to 50 milligrams of, new, uh, of PTU, propyl thiourosal. Simple conversion 1 is to 10. So the guidelines again the same thing uh, according to uh, ITS and FOXY for overt hyperthyroidism during pregnancy thionomides are the treatment of choice. PTU is recommended because of the uh, increased risk of um, uh, birth defects with methimazole and carbimazole and you can switch to these drugs in the second trimester. If patients who are on very low, of, low dose of antithyroid drugs prior to pregnancy, you can actually consider stopping it. You don't have to really treat it because subclinical hypothyroidism or very low, very, very low, very uh, mildly raised levels of T free T3 and free T4 actually do not cause any uh, risk to the pregnancy. So if the patient is asymptomatic and very slightly high, thyrotoxic, you can actually leave it, do not need to treat this patient in the first trimester. In the second trimester, obviously you can. When is surgery indicated? Sometimes, you know, when a patient has very bad uh, 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 thyrotoxicosis, not controlled with at least 300 microgram, milligrams of PTU or 40 milligrams of methimazole, you can consider surgery, but it is generally considered that, that the second trimester is the safest time for surgery. Or however, you have to take this into account if the patient is going into a fulminant heart failure or any other risks, then you have to consider weigh the benefits and risks of surgery against um, uh, uh, medical management. Definitely I-131 radioactive iodine is not recommended in pregnancy or in lactation. And anybody who is uh, who has an inadvertent exposure, so for example, I had a patient who went for us, uh, who went for radioactive iodine in spite of me telling her not to get pregnant. She got pregnant within two months of having the radioactive iodine. Unfortunately, we had to advise her against continuing the pregnancy because uh, it is contraindicated for at least three months after you receive any sort of radioactive iodine. So, um, then if the mother is euthyroid but positive for thyroid receptor antibodies, there is a possibility of fetal thyrotoxicosis because the, the thyroid receptor antibodies of the mother stimulate the baby's thyroid and the baby can develop thyrotoxicosis. If babies, all other causes of fetal tachycardia are ruled out, then you can actually start the mother on methimazole and carbimazole to actually control the fetal thyroid uh, production. Subclinical hyperthyroidism does not warrant any treatment. No need to do anything. Just watch it every six weeks. Make sure it is normal. If it is high, of course, it's going up, you treat. Otherwise, subclinical means TSH is suppressed, but 3T3, T4 levels are normal. Nothing to do. Lastly, coming to thyroid nodules in pregnancy. Thyroid is, is the thyroid production, and the, uh, the pre-existing pre nodules also tend to grow or they can actually be more apparent because the inside, the thyroid inside is swollen, it pushes the nodule out. Most palpated nodules of the thyroid are hyperplastic, 
but 5 to 20 percent the real number is almost about 8 percent are true neoplasms which is malignancies or carcinomas and which have to be operated um, the approach to the diagnosis is similar that means you do an ultrasound and then you do an ultrasound guided FNA and you do a TSH level first of all to make sure if it is cold if, if it's a functioning nodule or not if it's a functioning nodule the treatment is different if it's a non-functioning nodule then you do an ultrasound and the uh, uh, and the ultrasound guided FNA and what to do next so first a woman should be evaluated then if the nodule is malignant or showing rapid growth you consider surgery in the second trimester if the nodule is benign or uh, benign then no further evaluation except in cases of high TSH no need to do anything if you if needed the patient is given leothyroxine to normalize the TSH otherwise if it's benign nothing just follow up after pregnancy after uh, breastfeeding if it is malignant you consider surgery in the second trimester after, after you give the surgery, the radioactive iodine should be postponed until the delivery and uh, breastfeeding is done. You maintain the TSH at a suppressed level just like you would do with a non-pregnant patient and then wait. That's all. So, resect the patient, resect the, uh, the nodule or the, do a thyroidectomy in the second trimester and then suppress the TSH and then wait. Um, thyroid disorders can also lead to a lot of uh, infertility. So, we have talked about thyroid replacement in, 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 in pregnant patients. What about women who are seeking fertility? A lot of fertility centers are actually checking TSH and we are uh, uh, seeing a lot of uh, women who are, who are di being diagnosed with subclinical hypothyroidism, euthyroid autoimmunity and a lot of these patients um, have menstrual disturbances, oligomenorrhea, anovulation. So in view of this, you know, there are a few studies that have been so that have suggested that levothyroxine treatment is, is, is beneficial in women who have subclinical hypothyroidism and who are undergoing assisted reproduction uh, with anything, IVF, IUI, anything. So the studies basically show that you, if, the, if you have a higher TSH, you have a higher risk of, uh, sorry, if you have a lower TSH, you have a significantly higher delivery rate and especially if you treat it with levothyroxine, you achieve much higher success. Similar uh, trials have confirmed the same thing. There's a uh, lower miscarriage rate if you treat subclinical hypo hypothyroidism or autoimmune thyroid disease with levothyroxine, you have a higher success rate of pregnancies. So the guidelines echo the same thing. We have to evaluate the TSH in all women who are seeking fertility. Levothyroxine it should be given in for infertile women with overt hypothyroidism that is straightforward 1b evidence if the woman is subclinical hypothyroid who is attempting natural uh, conception you may give thyroid put, given its potential benefits because the risk is very less so you can give any woman who is autoimmune uh, thyroid disease or subclinical hypothyroidism you can give then the goal is to achieve a TSH concentration of less than 2.5 before they start for conception. Uh, postpartum thyroiditis very quickly, uh, it is a painless thyroiditis, some of it is, uh, is because of a destructive autoimmune mechanisms, some of it is just an inflammatory uh, uh, process that happens post-pregnancy, it can be associated with the postpartum depression also. The best thing is to just wait and see, don't do anything, it will resolve by itself. Check the antibodies if they are positive. You may consider that it may be a subliminal, sub, subclinical graves which was there and it has now flared up. You can present it, it can present it in three ways. It can be either just hyperthyroidism alone, hypothyroidism, or a transient hyperthyroidism fall, followed by hypothyroidism. It usually occurs with uh, after three to six months of delivery and it resolves within one year. So there is an initial phase of destruction of thyroid which causes an unregulated large amounts of T4, T3 to be, uh, to be released into the circulation which causes the hyperthyroidism followed by a quick uh, reduction once the inflammation is done. There might be a, a dip of the levels therefore the THS goes up and once the thyroid recovers you come back to a normal and there might be patients where there is a very high destruction of thyroxine, uh, sorry very high destruction of the thyroid gland where their thyroid follicles will not improve and these patients may end up with long-term levothyroxine.
the diagnosis is very simple. It is clinical based, um, uh, if, if especially if the antibodies are negative and uh, you investigate everything. Few pointers to invest to, to postpartum thyroiditis and graves. Um, it, postpartum thyroiditis within, uh, just within three months of delivery, graves will happen gen generally six months post delivery. Uh, clinical features of ophthalmopathy, thyroid enlargement, uh, goiter, or these will be present in Graves' disease, and there might not be these things in thyroiditis. Uh, the TSH receptor antibody will be elevated in Graves, not in thing. So what does the guidelines recommend? You don't have to routine screen for postpartum thyroiditis. A lot of women actually go into it. We don't even know that they had uh, hypothyroidism. You check if they are sick, um, and... Uh, uh, they should be checked with a TSH measurement at 3 and 6 postpartum. If the TSH is abnormal, it should be repeated without treatment. If uh, given, they are very asymptomatic and the T4, T3 levels are not very high. And, and um, transient, as I said, it will resolve in 12 months. It is advisable to assess TSH and uh, free T4 6 weeks after stopping the treatment. And um, after, yeah, some women go into hypothyroidism. And gestational thyroid, gestational uh, hypothyroidism, or postpartum thyroiditis, you check their TSH levels annually for at least five to ten years after the initial diagnosis. Treat as per what it is. If it's asymptomatic, you don't have with mildly abnormal TFTs, you don't treat. If they are symptomatic hyperthyroidism, you can just pro give supportive treatment like beta blockers until the thyroiditis is resolved. Just giving carbamazole or numerazole is not going to work because carbamazole and and uh, the thyroid follicles from them taking any iodine but here there's nothing you're not actually uh, there's no functioning thyroid follicle so giving carbamazole or other drugs will be a waste of time so you give supportive medicines unless this is autoimmune graves disease you give the uh, thyroid uh, uh, antithyroid drugs if the patient is symptomatic hypothyroidism you treat with levothyroxine so that's all thank you very much for listening thank you kalyan it's open for discussion comment audience now a AI we know everything uh, in it by a so but the conferences for interaction if there's no interaction uh, waste of time for everybody <laughs> so we're wasting valuable time so we expect to get an interaction and uh, I, I request all the speakers, whenever there is a data is there from Hyderabad, India, try to present so that we are happy. I'm Associate Professor Anjali. We love to have a teaching institutions, any, any paper presentation, try to present. I, re I request Rakesh Shai, Professor of Endocrinology. He has a data published in uh, Indian Journal of uh, Endocrinology from Usmania Medical College, Pregnancy, Thyroid. So we, we love to hear from uh, all the uh, this thing, our data. If we, if, we will not, if we will not present our data, who is going to... So there is a lot of... Rakesh, can you highlight the Usmania data of pregnancy thyroid so that we are happy to hear from you. So I think uh, Kalyan gave a good overview of uh, the problem of thyroid disorders in pregnancy and he has covered every aspect of it ex exhaustively. So, uh, well... Uh, with regard to what uh, uh, Srinivas was mentioning about uh, the data which we have from uh, from you know 11 centers across the country, we had looked at the prevalence uh, of thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy, and we had a close to about 10 percent prevalence of uh, thyroid dysfunction. And then we looked at antibodies. Antibodies is about 25 percent prevalence, uh, 20 percent, uh, close to 19 to 20 percent uh, prevalence of uh, antibody, TPO antibody positivity okay. during pregnancy. <coughs> that was what uh, was there. And I think uh, you have, uh, you know, beautifully uh, covered all these aspects uh, very nicely. Sridhar, you would like to add something? So I think uh, the antibody level uh, guidelines recommending, I think, uh, about 2.5, but in Indian setup, it may be very difficult. So if anything more than 4, definitely we will be treating the subclinical hypothyroidism in pregnancy. So 2.5 to 4, you may have the individualized approach, like a very 
uh, high risk pregnancy or any infertility long period of infertility or any other positive family history or autoimmunity in such cases if antibody is doing is the resource limited setting then you can individualize so up to four nowadays uh, guidelines are stressing that no need to much panic about so if anything beyond four in pregnancy we have to be treated 2.5 to 4 individualized approach our antibodies are available very well we can go go ahead then the prevalence also which i was speaking of we looked at four although at that point of time 2.5 was being the was used as the cutoff uh, we used uh, four, four that was 2012 i think and uh, so we used four as a cutoff and the other uh, issue is about uh, you know infertility and uh, going, when uh, those who are on treatment uh, with uh, ART. I think the, the use of gonadotropins actually increases the increases the uh, the uh, uh, turnover and uh, that that's the reason why they have a very significant uh, uh, they, they, they tend to have even normal women who are normal earlier who tend to have a 30 percent of them have a rise in their TSH and that's the reason why we need to screen them and we need to sort of treat them if they have a rise in their TSH. Thank you, sir. In my uh, experience, I have not got any malformations or uh, congenital anomalies in hypothyroidism on treatment. If they are very well treated, uh, free T3, free T4, TSH, as Kalyan told, it is a TSH should be 2.5 to 3 only. Above 3, any suspicion or any autoimmune ATP positive a PTO positive should be treated to, for the hypothyroidism. And uh, I had only one hypothyroidism, thyrotoxicosis, stillbirth, except that last 30 years I have not encountered any malformation. If you treat correctly, all hypothyroid should have a safe delivery. Everybody close. Regarding PTU, PTU dosage, PTU dosage, you said the dosage of minimal dose will not cause permanent, permanent hepatic failure. Is there any, which dose, up to what dose, any safety, any guy? So from, uh, I, on the top of my head, I think 200 milligrams or because what they've actually, I saw one paper, I don't quote me on this, but all cases of fulminant hepatitis, 200 milligrams or more of PTU, which is, that is where it causes fulminant hepatitis, but I'm happy to be corrected if there's anything. 200 milligrams of more or the, all the cases of hepatitis happen in that dose only. Rakesh, do you have any expert? Or, um, uh, so usually it is an idiosyncratic reaction. So it may not be dose dependent, but uh, uh, usually first trimester alone we will give PTU. Uh, after once, uh, many of the times they come late or they may be at least 12 weeks or uh, 8 weeks apart. So many of the times we won't be putting into the PTU. Already if they are on uh, comfortable doses and uh, controlled with carbimazole, methimazole, we will be continuing. Only in uh, very, uh, because the chance of uh, placental cross age is less with the PTU because of the more protein. That was the, the aim of uh, being first trimester. Otherwise, we have to maintain that individual before pregnancy itself PTU and continue till uh, third uh, month or first trimester. Then we have to switch over. But many of the times uh, it is an idiosyncratic, but uh, once happened it will be very fatal. And uh, so it is a, uh, it's not unlikely dose dependent, but up to 300 milligram I think it is a safer dose we can give no issues. So somebody on PTU try to do a LFT, not uh, should that load, even on low doses also try to do a LFT and mount the permanent hepatic failure in somebody on PTU. That was the message. And uh, one more important this thing. In presence of Endocrine Society of India, President, uh, we are talking about uh, obstetric, guide, obstetric society guidelines of thyroid. Uh, it is proud for a uh, obstetrician because it reverse will happen. All the gynecology societies will talk about endocrine society guidelines. <laughs> Here we are on endocrine conference in presence of Endocrine Society President. We are talking about obstetric society guidelines and yeah. up to date. So the, I think uh, they should be proud. Then no, just to mention that I think the ITS, uh, ITS, the and ITS has come out with a recent update of the guideline to 2022. So that is uh, something. Okay. So th thank you, valuable. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. I think we are checking on time. We are sorry, late for, later. We are on, late for another uh, half an hour. I think Rinda is going to cover.